I'm Eddie Cannell. And I'm Tom Cannell. Welcome everyone. This is the Mortgage Brothers Team Podcast. And today we are talking about something that is, of course, a sad, you know, hard time for a lot of folks, a lot of our customers who at times will go through, which is divorce. Yeah, divorce is always a very, very tough emotional time that you're you're thinking about multiple different things. And part of it is, you know, the, the roof over your head. That's one of the most critical things that you think through uh, throughout your whole life, actually. And when you're going through a divorce, um, you probably can't help but think, you know, what do we do with the house? So we thought we'd have a quick little podcast on, you know, divorce and how it affects financing, you know, whether, you know, you're, you're refinancing or you're actually looking to start fresh and, and purchase. Yeah. And Tom, you were saying, I think uh, earlier that one of the advice is, what's the advice that yeah, you it, hear a lot about? You, you know, you hear, um, you know, always, always go after and find a good attorney, a good financial planner and a darn good mortgage broker. So we'd, we'd love to be that mortgage broker for you. But, but those are, I think, three, you know, basic uh, food groups per se of what you'd need in order to steer you through the, the right, you know, turns and twists as you go through that unfortunate event that you're going through. So um, definitely seek uh, legal advice. Um, and we're just here to give you some mortgage advice. Yeah. And I think that what we can talk about now is just what's the most typical scenarios that we see our borrowers who come to us. In most cases, one spouse is either going to stay in the home. This is very common. One, one wants to stay in the home and refinance into that, that, that loan into their name alone, while the other spouse wants to, uh, of course, get off the title, get off the, the current note, the mortgage, and buy another property. Mm -hmm. And they'll come to us uh, sometimes for an advance, you know, they haven't filed yet, but they're thinking about filing and they want to get their ducks in a row. Or uh, they'll call us, uh, you know, several days after the decree is finalized saying, okay, we need to move forward. So we always, we always recommend on the front end side, giving us a call, we can help kind of strategize, figure out timing on, on how this is going to work. Because one of the, one of the, key factors is, is once you divorce, you're, you're really kind of a sole and separate person and, and you will act autonomously uh, when it comes to qualifying. And so it'd be important to know whether or not you qualify for that, that home that right. you may be staying in. So uh, give us a call early. So I would also, now I'm going to probably just stay that it's possible. A lot of, a lot of our borrowers will get their financing in order before the divorce is finalized. And in many ways, that just helps kind of set up everything uh, ahead of time. Now, that doesn't, that is if the borrowers typically who are going to be qualifying, right, for the mortgage, if they aren't depending on income, like child support, alimony, or any of the debts that are on their credit, if, if, if the other spouse is not going to be responsible for them, the ex-spouse is not going to be responsible for those items, they can oftentimes get the refinance done if we're doing a refinance before the divorce is mm -hmm. finalized. Yeah, good point. Um, but, good point. But of course, I think that that happens, and I, I'm not, I don't know what a percentage, maybe it's a minority, maybe let's just say 30% of the time mm -hmm. we will mm -hmm. do that. But the other uh, majority of the times, the divorce is finalized and we, we, we do the, the financing afterwards. And people mm -hmm. have asked us too, there's been a lot of misunderstandings about when you can do it. If a borrower files for divorce, can we do financing? And it's not finalized yet. The answer is yes, because there, we, in the past, lenders, banks used to say, no, if you file, we can't do any financing. We're, you're kind of in limbo until it's finalized. But today, the understanding among the community is unless, until it's finalized, you're still married and that's it. Mm -hmm. the, the application itself does not ask, have you filed or are you in the middle of? The idea is you are married and it's not finalized. Okay, so good point. Um, and I will add to that. So that would apply to individuals that have separate income and that they could, they could qualify on their own for these mortgages. If you are relying on a divorce decree for alimony or child support to be that income, obviously having that decree finalized would be a critical part to the equation. Right. 
So, so let, okay. let's talk about that. Okay, so someone has, they now have been officially divorced and they need child support or alimony. Um, they, we, we can't just, the moment the divorce is finalized, we can't just give you credit for the alimony and child support. We have to actually wait a waiting period, which mm-hmm. we call a seasoning period, but it's this waiting period is different for the loan programs. And Tom, maybe you can go through that. Yeah. And I would just tell you, it's a little bit frustrating because you'd, you'd think, you know, when, when a judge signs off on a decree and it states that there's going to be 3000 or 4000 or 5000 worth of income monthly, you could count that immediately. Um, and, and really, there's a reasonable um, explanation. There, there needs to be that history. There needs to be that look back to where um, the one party has been successful in making those payments and it's going to continue to make them. So there is that seasoning component as frustrating as it could be. Um, you know, it, it's there. So for conventional financing, there's uh, what we call six receipts. So actually six um, re- receipts or, or taken of, of that income. Six um, months, six months, six months. Okay. And, um, and what we've done in the past is we've started a file after the fifth month's uh, receipt um, and just waited to close until, you know, a week or so after that six, that sixth payment is received. So we don't have to wait to start the application until you've received all six, but just keep that in mind. So that is conventional financing. When it comes to FHA and VA, they're a lot more lenient. They're half of that. So, Ed, I think it's three months receipt. Three, three months of receipt, yeah. Okay. And then if you want to uh, abandon uh, conventional financing limits and not go FHA or VA and you want to go jumbo, um, then you're going to wait twice the conventional um, seasoning period, which will be 12 months. So, uh, six for conventional, three for FHA and VA, and 12 months for jumbo. That's right. Um, and and the uh, and the critical thing is is that there is a continuance factor. So not only have you received a certain amount of payments um, to prove that you know the future ones will come, but there also has to be thirty six months of continuous payment coming remaining they, remaining. They can't stop in in nineteen months or twenty two months. So that's an important piece. Ned, I don't know if you know how long alimony or child support typically um, well is paid typically it's until the child is 18 and that's when we see that's when the judges usually will cut off or you know on the, on the final divorces or the mm-hmm. decrees mm-hmm. so if, if you if you have you know children that are 15 years or younger you're going to be you, you know you'll have three years remaining in most cases right and, and sometimes one child is a you know going to only be you know, for maybe a year, maybe they're 17, 16 years old. Mm-hmm. So we have to make sure we adjust that, uh, that child support, um, okay. alimony. So anyway, definitely something to, to think of and plan. Yeah, absolutely. And, spe- and speaking of planning, um, I had a borrower, uh, they were very concerned about the credit. Um, they knew that their credits were, were joint credits and that, um, you know, a debt that maybe one of the spouses was responsible for, they knew was going to have some late payments. And so, you know, they, they got onto the clock sooner than later and pulled credit prior to, um, you, know, you know, credit uh, diminishing. Right. So I thought that was an interesting point. So think about uh, the credit angle. Also, um, no to, we talked about the income side, um, uh, but on the debt side, even if you're responsible for certain debts and you know it's going to be on your credit report and you're panicking because you've got a suburban and you've got, a, you know, a primary old house and a cabin up north, um, the decree will dictate what liabilities are against you. So that, that's the one of the few times the credit report will subordinate to, to something. Um, and that decree is really the, the final say. So if it says, you know, the one spouse is responsible for the suburban and the second home, it doesn't matter if the credit report says that you are. Right. So I, right. Thought, I thought that was important. What, uh, what, correct. And a lot of times that's a reason why we would wait until you have a finalized divorce decree because sometimes a borrower can't, has these items on their credit report. They have to wait until the divorce decree actually makes that response, makes that, that loan, that credit card, right. that car loan, the responsibility of the ex spouse. Right. right. So, right. so yes, uh, that is good, uh, to, to know. And, what, 
So besides the divorce decree, what other documents um, are, are typically needed? Not that this is going to be a, a, you know, a big long list, but I mean, typically we'll, we'll be requesting what? Well, or maybe, maybe we don't even, we know, don't even request the title will request it. Right. So we don't need to pull your ex-spouse's credit report. Uh, we typically don't need their bank statements, but of course, an, if the ex-spouse is at least amiable, you know, you have an amiable, amiable relationship with them and they can work with you through, through this, it always helps because there will be a quick claim deed that they will sign at the title because if they're on title, they're going to need to sign off. Uh, of course, the, anyway, so as far as documents, I would say that the divorce decree, maybe some bank statements, maybe the ex-spouse would provide because we might have to prove the, uh, the deposits, like the alimony or child support mm-hmm. came, came from. Mm-hmm. Right. We, because have so, to, we have to be able to track that it came from the ex-spouse. Right. You know, uh, couples can have multiple bank accounts. And if there was payment made um, out of a joint uh, account, but one of the accounts went with one of the spouses, then that could be a way of kind of tracking that. Yes, this account actually belongs, you know, you know, belongs to the husband. I mean, yeah. we, can, we can show show proof or to the wife. Yeah. I mean, ideally, if the transaction history of the borrower actually can, can you know, has the information on there that really helps too um, for the, you know, the payments. Mm-hmm. But, okay. But yeah, I, I think that at the end, the end of the day, there's a, a quick claim is signed. So your ex-spouse is now officially off the property. The mortgage is in your name alone. You own the home alone. And uh, right. that is something we can help you with. If you have any questions, everyone's situation is going to be a little unique. So we work around a lot of different, you know, speaking of, of unique, this is uh, something that we do a lot of, which is just a, a benefit of working with a group like us. But um, if you structure the loan the right way, you can actually refinance and do a cash out um, without getting um, any uh, uh, pricing hits for the cash outs. That's um, a, and and yeah, you can add, you I can totally add, forgot about that. We, we forgot about it. <laughs> You can actually do a rate and term refi, which is a lower interest rate, even though you're technically doing a cash out in order to pay off your spouse for his or her portion of the equity. Yeah, so that's, that's right. A- so to summarize, if, if the judge, if the court says that you owe, it's court ordered that the equity, a certain equity portion goes to your ex-spouse, the cash, the cash out transaction, cash out refinance that we would do on that loan would not be, would be priced not as a cash out, but as a rate and term refinance. So it's a lower interest rate. Right. And one of the few exceptions that, that ever a cash out is treated, which I think is a really nice, um, maybe not benefit, but it's a little consoling to, to know that F. Fannie Mae understands and Freddie Mac understands. Yeah. I mean, so we can go up to 90% on, on a, you know, conventional loans, we can go up to 95% loan to value on the rate and term refinance. So even though, even whereas, though, whereas the cash outs limited. To right. Them. Yeah. So not only do you get the benefit of the uh, pricing, uh, the interest rate, but also the LTV. Right. And that's huge. So um, hopefully this was somewhat helpful. Yeah. Um, if anyone has any questions, let us know. Um, I think that we've covered everything uh, that, that I think was helpful and you have a good week. Tell yeah. me, time, time to go home. Yeah. Let's go home. All right. All right. Thank you folks. Bye everyone. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the Mortgage Brothers Show. Please let us know if you have any questions you'd like us to answer on this podcast. You can email your questions to tom at azmortgagebrothers.com or yours truly at eddie at azmortgagebrothers.com. And be sure to ask us for a free quote on your next mortgage. Tom and I will personally work with you and help you through the whole process. Signature Home Loans LLC does not provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. This material has been prepared for informational purposes only. You should consult your own tax, legal, and accounting advisors before engaging in any transaction. Signature Home Loans, NMLS 107154, NMLS number 210917, and 1618695, equal housing lender.